One morning I woke up and I had a very vivid dream. As soon as I got up, I did this concept painting that ultimately became, you know, the jumping off point. No one at LEGO knew what was going on. I wanted to do something you know, off the radar. The idea behind it was to present something in a cinematic way and bring it to the company to show them as a potential new avenue for branding. Brian mentioned that he had a project that he wanted to talk to me about. So we got together at his place and he unveiled these amazing drawings. The drawings themselves were so exciting, all of space and nebulas and uh, uh, Lego planets. He said like, you know, do you think we could do this and we could pull this off? Oh my God, yes, let's definitely pull that off. Let's try <laughs> everything we can to try and pull that off. There's sort of this trend right now where a lot of spots are going 3D, so a lot of things are uh, computer generated, and we wanted to celebrate LEGO by making sure everything was practical. Even the miniatures, those are giant models completely built out of LEGO. Everything you see in the spot was real. I loved shooting uh, models and miniatures and all that stuff and lighting them, and Brian loves building them and creating them, so it just seemed like a perfect match. And so definitely I thought, oh my God, this is a chance for me to live out special effects fantasies. <laughs> Clearly, we knew this was a long shot. Like, the idea of creating a spec spot and trying to bring it to a huge company, we knew that there was like zero to none chance of this thing getting picked up. The goal really at the at the beginning, the outset of it, was just at the very least to be able to do this project and get it in front of some people who made who mattered or who we felt mattered at Lego. And so from there he assembled a small team of dedicated film and commercial enthusiasts. That's pretty much when we started to get this thing underway. The project is, when you see it, it's only a minute. And we hid so much stuff um, in the commercial that, you know, when you, when you watch it, it makes sense seeing it one way. But if you watch it again, you, you're looking for things, you start to notice a little more. There's a certain amount of joy that comes from seeing artists render their art expertly and well. And then you getting to be a part of a project that that art is in, that's very cool. Here we've got uh, some of the, the giant Lego planets featured at the end of the spot. Rather than build from scratch, the easiest thing to do is find a company that made uh, these giant Lego bins for your toys. Um, so it's exact proportions, same quality plastic, ABS plastic, and uh, from there, uh, a good friend from school, Aaron Holder, he, he helped me kind of basically cut into these pieces uh, with chisels and things to achieve this effect of large planets kind of being built. So yeah, after Holder would chisel these away, I would come in airbrush them, and then on the inside, these, these layers, these tiers, uh, if we pull it apart, this inner shell, you can see how we constructed these. Just foam core and poster board, thin pieces, poster board layered with zigzags to, to create that illusion of extra depth. Something else that's not totally seen in the spot, we had a series of fiber optics outfitted on each one as well. So each piece did light up, which is pretty cool. There's a lot of, a lot of little detail in these pieces, which were, were fun to make. Oh, that's something too. I'll talk about that. Was, sure. This was a, the fiber optics were actually just uh, like girls' hair barrettes with a LED light and a battery running through each brick. 
what young kid doesn't ever want to try to achieve a space door effect after seeing Star Wars and Space 1999 and everything where there's always a, you know, this old school like Star Trek sliding door. I turned once again to Aaron Holder and enlisted his help to uh, fabricate the interior of the ship. And we built it specifically so that, I mean, if the camera tilted up another inch or down another inch, the set ended. We only built what we needed. There were about six or seven people working simultaneously to pull that shot off. So seeing the space door being crafted and then have it go and then even better smoke go pshht, uh, oh, that was a fun moment. That was pretty cool. So here we have the, the moon surface created by Grant Hoffman. What you see here is only half of, uh, of the moon surface that we used. So we had double this amount. We had it split up into sections, so we had a sense of parallax. We had the, the foreground, very small mountains, and then in the very distance, very large mountains from the background. Wanted to play up the plasticity, the idea that this massive planet is built entirely out of tiny Lego bricks. Then he referenced uh, his Cinefix catalog and brought to Grant, I think one of the catalogs on 2010, sort of showing how the, the icy moonscape was built. And so Grant kind of, he worked off that, and I, I don't know it's totally what he used, but I know it's definitely a mixture of wax and uh, some sort of reflective flakes to help give that icy shine on the planet's surface. Here we're gonna take a look at the astronaut uniform featured in the spa. This was expertly crafted by Carrie Byrne. She stuck to the drawings almost exactly. Every line featured on the suit was on the drawing. She did an excellent job of the stitching in here. And this was kind of based on, I based my concept sketches around some newer designs that were being floated, I guess, by uh, NASA and MIT, which was more form-fitting suits. This is pretty cool. The classic Lego space patch. I've desaturated it so it's not as bright. <laughs> Next up, we've got the outer vest that goes over the astronaut suit. This is pretty much the life support system with like a digital readout and um, we've also got the oxygen tank on the back. So this is just the inside of the vest. Um, once I was in the astronaut suit, this would seal up. One of my old managers, Frank Denka from Lego, he he fashioned the chest piece here. And he, I mean, he went so far as to have it working. He had displays on it and stuff. So outfitting it with LEDs. It's all just uh, resin. So this is very, very fragile stuff here. Yeah, this thing's beautiful. <laughs> the, his details in here, translating just the, the rough design I sent over, the stuff, like, he did a phenomenal job with this. I was actually in the suit. I played both astronauts. The main astronaut featured uh, is named Christensen as a nod to Ola Kirk Christensen, the creator of LEGO. The second astronaut, his name was Serling, as a, a nod to Rod Serling of the Twilight Zone. The oxygen tank on the back here, you didn't really get to see a whole lot of it. So this is just bent, um, bent foam core, you can kind of see in here. These were two aluminum water tanks, water bottles. Um, I think a piece from like a, some sort of uh, sea monkey aquarium or something. I think this is from a deodorant stick. You can see where the gel comes through right here, spray painted silver. But yeah, this was, this was a fun little thing. It was totally unnecessary because like I said, we didn't see it, but it was one of those details that needed to be on the suit. People are so used to seeing CGI, they're just like, oh, well, you did that CGI. And like, if you're not there to say, no, that was a miniature, and they just saw it on YouTube, or whatever, they just like, oh, well, that looks cool. That was a cool computer model. Rather than do something computer generated, do something tactile and old school and celebrate what Lego is. It's a real product. 
So this is our expedition shuttle. This model was crafted by Mark John Stafford from LEGO. Usually upon, upon first viewing, most people, even on second viewing, don't realize uh, what they're seeing in the spot are in fact LEGO models, uh, which was pretty much the whole point of the spot. If you take a look at the overall silhouette, it's very similar to the traditional uh, space shuttle or what we know of, you know, the, the traditional NASA shuttle. And that was part of the part of the idea was to not do something so futuristic that it loses a silhouette of what we know. Cool details of the thrusters back here using pieces from uh, wheel wells, of the cross axles and things. Some beautiful little detail work down here with the, the wrenches. I think Mark put a lot of love into this and I think it shows. The overall piece probably weighs just, just a little under five pounds and it's not glued either. So if I were to drop this, it's done. It would just shatter. This here would have been the shuttle door the lander comes out of. So ideally that would be about the scale. The little lander would, which we'll see next, would fit in there and come out of there. It's a challenge because you don't see a lot of practical effects being done these days. That was one of the restraints um, I made sure to put onto the project itself. Everything has to be built from Lego. If it's gonna be a special effect, it has to be shot for real. So now we're gonna take a look at the moon lander. I would say this model weighs about, about seven, eight pounds. Originally, this was, we were trying to be cost effective, so I had Mark only build half of the model based on my designs. So that was what you see here, the front door, and uh, these are awesome thrusters. While shooting, we were like, you know what? It's probably gonna be better if we just do a 360. So at that time, I went ahead and I just built the back side of this so we would have a full 360 model. So the, the weathering was done uh, using ground charcoal and it was just brushed onto the model to, to give it some use, some, some of that worn effect. Uh, another detail that Mark had built to scale was the uh, just the stairwell that detaches from the lander. I added the uh, astronaut boot prints onto the steps with, um, with the charcoal. This is cool, the locking mechanism is a, is a pistol and a sextant. Other details with, as far as the weathering goes, was uh, using just a um, metallic paint marker and hitting edges in here, there, on the, the metallic pieces for the thrusters. The hydraulics on the landing gear, it does work. If I pick it up, the pieces are, are uh, spring-loaded, so the, the legs do move. Again, none of this is glued together, so we had this had to be very delicately assembled and brought over from Denmark. When somebody injects the word miniatures, there is a level of excitement. There's also a level of disbelief, like, oh, you're not going to be able to do that. When someone, especially someone from the company that had seen the spot, uh, when they didn't realize what they were actually looking at, that was a pretty cool moment to say, no, you're actually, you're seeing your product front and center. It's being shown and showcased in every shot from frame one. What's the, uh... Well, just like Navy SEALs accept death, that on every mission that they go on, they're pretty sure that they're gonna die, and they just totally accept death. I accepted 100% that this was gonna take forever <laughs> to do. <laughs> this process was one in which it became obvious to Brian and I that we were going to need to enlist a multitude of people we were scared we were gonna, you know, burn any artist out because we knew this is gonna be the lengthiest part of the process. 
There's so much that was provided from Vinny and Brian as far as what they shot, the cloud tank and the models and everything. Finding the right moments, it just took time. There's no way around it and you have to be able to give it that time. Otherwise, you know, it's just not gonna come together the way you want it to. One thing that was excellent about getting to meet Eric was he was very open to us being in the studio with him. There was a lot of inspiration in how it was supposed to be executed. There was a tone and a thread, a visual thread, that definitely needed to be carried out from beginning to end. Those feelings that Vinny and Brian had for the project totally enveloped how I wanted the graphics and everything to translate in the final product. Brian's artwork required a nebula. We gotta do a cloud tank. Cloud tank footage is definitely a mixed bag, partially because it's really at the basic level experimentation. We lit it, we shot lasers through it, and super bright pen lights and, and, and flashlights, and that was so much fun. So trying to bring that into the piece was a bit tricky at times too. Every once in a while, unfortunately, the uh, tank might have gotten bumped and things shift a little bit more than you would have liked it to. At the same time that we're doing all this stuff physically and shooting all these elements, they have to be combined digitally expertly if they're going to uh, have the textures and the weight we wanted them to have. Brian and Vinny wanted everything to absolutely be practical. They wanted any sort of digital compositing and things to look like it was legit and tactile. The wide shot of the lunar landing, besides like setting up all the moon in like several different layers, it was kind of also interesting developing the way the smoke was coming off the ship and then adding in like the light and stuff. It was a really just another shot that was really interesting to work on. The, the feeling of success, the feeling of overcoming that hurdle was infinitely better than um, just us giving up and it taking less time. I think one of the hardest shots to actually pull together was the last shot. It probably seems a little bit obvious, but there's just so much going on. We were getting very specific about how we wanted things to move as far as the clouds. We were looking at things that appeared to have like a universe lightning storm. The way that the bricks were floating all had to seem like they were sharing the same space. So that in particular, it was just like a lot of back and forth, a lot of peeling away layers that we thought were working, but in the end didn't really work the way we wanted them to. I feel like we went through like six or eight different explosions. And in the end, I think we even went back to one that we didn't think was working, but we really liked. I had already had some ideas in mind for what the sound or the score would be. I was a big fan of uh, this electronic experimental musician who goes by the name of Lorne. This was someone that was kind of always on my radar. I didn't give him anything to go on because I didn't want him to know it was going to be a Lego spot, so I sent him a blind link and just a, you know, an email out of the blue, he got back like the next day. He was genuinely touched and excited by the spot. Hearing that soundtrack for the first time was incredible. It totally married everything together. It's like the cherry on top. It didn't get any better than that. This is exactly like what I had in mind and, the, and he came through. An idea that I reached out to uh, Lauren with, uh, I had asked him to to take a picture of Ola Kirk Christensen, the creator of Lego, turning it into a wave or a spectrogram and hiding that in the audio somewhere. What you're hearing in the beginning glitch at the, at the front of the commercial is an image of the creator. So it's kind of like infusing a bit of his spirit into the DNA of the piece. For me, I've been extremely proud about working on this project from the standpoint that it's one of the most unique cinematic pieces I've been able to partake in. There were so many moments of being over the moon at the end of this whole process that we just like, just when you thought it couldn't get better, it kept getting better. It kind of seems crazy, I guess, um, because all this work and what we have to show for it is only 60 seconds. 